I did want to start with a brief discussion of what it is that we do. I'm situated here at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, which is part of the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. I work for the Chandrax Observatory, which is operated for NASA by SAO, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, here at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. It's a whole lot of word salad uh, that essentially means some really cool things are happening not too far away from you all. Uh, our control center for this observatory is actually out in Burlington, Massachusetts, because we relocated a few years ago. But Chander is a space telescope, like a sister telescope to the Hubble or the James Webb Space Telescope that um, observes the X-ray universe. So we're looking at really high energy uh, phenomena and cosmic events. Chander goes about a third of the way to the moon at its farthest distance from Earth. And that means it's got a really great bird's eye view of that high energy X-ray extreme kind of universe. Tanner's about the size of a school bus and it was the largest payload ever to be fit inside the space shuttle bay. It was launched in 1999. So it's been in operation almost for 25 years. I'm just going to show a few different examples of the type of objects we get to study with Chandra, things like exploding stars, things like black holes, things like colliding galaxies and ever so much more. So there's a lot of stuff that you can really study with the X-ray light that Chandler gets to capture. But I wanna turn the discussion here at this point to what we do with that capture of data and for whom we work to process that data. So all of the information that comes down from Chandra, it's essentially just a bunch of numbers. It's packaged up in a digital suitcase of binary code, and we get to turn it into things like this, images. We've got a beautiful collection of images that have been contributed to or created by the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Um, and it's all types of different objects from stellar nurseries and, you know, baby stars being born to stars that are dancing together stars like our sun that are mature and sort of starting to puff off their outer layers creating these beautiful nebulas stars that are more massive than our sun that have exploded their guts out all over the universe collections of stars and gas and dust that make up galaxies galaxies that are hanging out together in groups and even clusters of galaxies which are the largest gravitationally bound objects in our universe so it can be hundreds or even thousands of galaxies all enveloped in hot gas, and some of which look like they are smiling back at us thanks to gravitational lensing. So our universe is a truly beautiful and exciting place, but all of the images that I've just showed you, they're all just based on these numerical data. Everything that we do in astronomy these days is really rather digital. And so that digital information has to be translated from something that we can't see into something that we can perhaps see. So what are we doing? We're capturing this light that has been traveling to us for thousands, if not millions or billions of years. The scientific detectors, the instruments on board spacecraft like Chandra, they are recording that information. They're packaging it up into binary code, a suitcase, if you will, that then is transmitted through NASA's deep space network before finally it makes its way up to uh, here uh, on the Harvard campus. And eventually it's just translated from one form into another. So those binary bits of data are unpacked into a table and the table has the recording of the time, the location, and the energy of each photon, each little packet of energy that was collected during the observation. So we're still not at the point where we've got a real visual. But the next step is to take software and create that visual representation of the object. Now, again, especially when we're looking at X-ray light, this is light that no human can naturally see, right? We None of us have X-ray vision unless there's a few supermen or superwomen lurking in the um, panel here. Uh, so for the most part, we cannot see any data from Chandra or even much of the data that Hubble observes, which is too distant or in different kinds of light that, that humans can't see. We have to translate this. So we can translate it into the visual representation of an object. We can apply color. Again, color isn't something that would naturally be captured because it's beyond human vision too. And when we've got a lot of data, we can slowly build up our archive of information and we can process an image so that we've got a really incredible view of something like this object here, which is Cassiopeia A an exploded star about 11,000 light years away. 
where a light year is the distance that light travels, which is about 10 trillion kilometers. So this is cosmically speaking, relatively nearby. We're looking at about a million seconds worth of data from Chandra um, and a little sprinkling of data from Hubble to give us that starry background as well. But we don't have to just work with images, right? We have different kinds of data. We can create three-dimensional models if we have really good information, if we understand which of the light is moving away from us, which of the light is moving towards us, for example, or if we have good mathematical models to help us build a simulation. In this case, we've taken different kinds of data from the Chandra X-ray Observatory, as well as other telescopes to create a three-dimensional model of this exploded star, this, stellar debris field that's expanding out into the galaxy. And once we had this 3D model, which we worked on with uh, scientist Tracy Delaney back in 2008, 2009, this was sort of a light bulb moment for me. Like, oh, of course, like we can do different things with our data. We don't just have to create an image. And so once we had that 3D model, we started experimenting with what we can do. And 3D printing was one of the obvious things that we tried. Uh, we had some friends at the Smithsonian who had recently 3D scanned and then 3D printed President Obama's head at the time. And so we sort of relied on their expertise to help us learn how to do some of this 3D printing. And this is the result. So now we're looking at this stellar debris, this stellar barf, if you will, and we've got it color coded by the chemical emission. So we've got the pockets of iron in green got the silicon and sulfur in red, for example, so that we can sort of place where some of these elements are. That's really useful because with a star like Cassiopeia A, before it explodes, iron is a heavy element that's building up right at its core, right before the explosion. And so then when you see a version of the remnant or the remains of that stellar material and the iron is now on the perimeter or more towards the perimeter, that's actually showing you and helping to showcase the fact that a star like Cassiopeia A can turn itself inside out when it explodes. So these are the sorts of things that we're getting to play with. And again, this was happening in the, you know, the 2000s and really just sort of made me feel like I needed to do a better job exploring other ways of making meaning, other ways of outputting our data for more users. Um, we started working with uh, different audiences. And one of the groups was the National Federation of the Blind. We took a few different models to work with them, to work with a group of students who are all either blind or low vision to be able to understand how 3D models that are 3D printed could be improved. And that session was an absolute whirlwind, incredibly informative um, two days that we had had with the group. And we learned a lot about how to better 3D print that, you know, bigger is often better within reason, that having a little bit more space to handle tactilely the information was great for the user. Resolution was important. So yes, if you have a 3D printer that's very cheap, it's still better than nothing. But if you can get a higher quality 3D printer, you can improve how they process information with that better quality overall. Also, the strength and the reinforcing of those parts, those bits and pieces of those models was really important access to the data. One really obvious thing was the students really made it obvious to us that if you cut the model in half, users would have access to both internal and external information in the model, which was of course, like, of course, you know, of course that's something we should be doing. And we devised a system where we were reattaching the models with a little magnet so that it could still be used as a whole. Um, but overall, this was a we would like more of these models. We would like more of this content in this tactile quality. And we've ever we found ever since then, we've done a lot of user testing as well that these models, these 3D prints are not only useful people for people who are blind or low vision, um, but also for all different kinds of learners, young and old, particularly children who like to really touch things and handle things. Having these 3D prints has been a really great way to make a very esoteric science like astronomy be a little bit more um, knowable or explorable for different kinds of learners. So we had this 3D printing project, which we, I was really pleased with, and I thought we could do more. We've since brought this model and others like it into virtual reality. This is a student of mine who is exploring this 3D model now in a VR yurt. 
down at Brown University and she's learning about the constituent parts. We can bring it into augmented reality. This is a researcher that I worked with and he's just demonstrating how now this version you could build up by different kinds of material. Um, so you'll see this person is now turning on and off the silicon, the iron, the calcium, the, the jets and essentially building an exploded star in his AR system. Um, with us. And we've brought it into hologram based screens as well. And most recently, we've brought it into sound. So data sonification was something that we started over the pandemic, because we had really felt like we were losing touch with our, our core audiences. We had spent time building relationships with communities of people who are blind or low vision, and not being able to access our 3D printers or to be in a room with other people with a 3D print just made it feel like that entire community group would you know, disappear from us. And so one of the projects that I had sort of been fiddling along with just for fun now all of a sudden became a priority. And so working in data sonification or the idea of translating information into sound um, became a, an important part of what we produce. So here is that same data of Cassiopeia that I've been showing along. This is just the two dimensional version back to that, the deeper about 1 million seconds worth of time that Chandra captured. And now what we've done is we've selected all of those different kinds of chemical emission, the iron, the silicon, the calcium, the sulfur, and we've assigned them to a different sound. And we're just scanning the data for, with a mathematical mapping of the pixels into sound from the inside, that leftover core of the star, all the way out to the perimeter. And so here is what a little snippet of Cassiopeia sounds like when you translate the pixel values into sound. And we have all the constituent parts on our website so users can select which kind of sound to play. Do we want to hear just the silicon? Do we want to hear just the iron, et cetera? Um, but this type of mathematical mapping or, or sonification has been, I think, a really fun way to explore the data. And what's interesting is all of those versions that, that we've looked through so far, the plain image, the 3D model, the virtual reality, all of that came from the same package of ones and zeros. This is an actual snippet of the binary code that underlays all of that data, all of that sciencey goodness um, that we've just walked through. So what is sonification? Sonification is just this idea of translating information into sound. It's an area of research that has been going on for some time. There are a number of people that have been doing really wonderful work in it. Dr. Wanda Diaz is an astronomer and computer scientist, for example, who uses data sonification as a tool to be able to research stars. She's been blind since she was a teenager. So for her, sonification is one of the main methodologies that she can use to actually understand what is happening to different populations of stars. Um, we've done a bunch of other sonifications since the first example that I showed you. I thought it'd be useful to run through a few more to give a sense of what this project has been like. This one is one of my favorites. Scientifically, this is a really important image. It's the deepest X-ray image ever obtained. Chandra looked at an object or a patch of the sky, if you will, for like 40 days and nights and captured this, which is essentially a field of thousands of black holes or galaxies with very supermassive black holes in them. And so we've been able to cut our data into energy levels where the lowest energy material, the, the medium energy material, and then the highest energy material all have different sounds assigned to them. And it's the same mathematical mapping, but now we're sweeping from the bottom of the image up so that this way we can utilize stereo sound and you can hopefully feel like you're immersed in this field of black holes. I don't think you'll hear stereo sound through Zoom because Zoom doesn't really allow for that, but you can play it on the website afterwards to get a sense of what it sounds like. And here is um, what thousands of black holes mapped into sound sounds like.
So for me, I've worked for Chandra since the beginning. I've been working on the data since it first started coming down from the telescope. And so I know this data really well. And this image was one that I always found sort of challenging because scientifically it's important, but visually it doesn't necessarily convey all of that sciencey goodness, right? It's just, it looks like a black canvas that has had a bunch of multicolored dots painted onto it, right? It doesn't necessarily tell the story. But the data sonification sort of helps tell that story a little bit better, or at least through a different path, uh, which I really, really enjoy. Um, I'm going to play one more example. This is, or maybe two more. This is another exploded star. This is Tycho's supernova remnant. We are looking mostly at X-ray data, all of that debris again that we're seeing, and then that really beautiful uh, shock that goes all the way around the perimeter, and then the drop off into just space, just empty space. Now, I like this one. This one has different musical instruments assigned to it versus just a synthesized tone. It's a combination. So you'll hear the optical field of space, if you will, being played by a harp. And then the X-ray data is a more synthetic sound. It's a layer of synthetic sounds. The point of doing that is to clearly differentiate the different kinds of light that someone who's blind or low vision will be hearing. That's really important. Most of these um, sonifications that we're doing, we've created them not just for people who are blind or low vision, but with people who are blind or low vision. So we're incorporating the user feedback and the user perspective and the community perspective throughout the process at different stages. And having the different sounds be, you know, audible in a way that when you're creating a mental map, it really helps you make sense of the data has been a really important factor. So here's what this supernova remnant sounds like. Um, So hopefully you could hear that my dog found it so exciting that he wanted to add in and bark as well. Um, but hopefully you get this sense of that piece. And I think that one's really exciting in the sense that it actually helps the user clearly differentiate how much stuff or how much space this, this expanding debris field takes up. And then that sharp drop off into the more nothingness of more empty outer space. And again, that's that's feedback that we've been incorporating the whole time that it's really important to have those clean distinctions and to have the composite pieces available separately as well. So users can control hearing it, just the optical field and the harp, just the x-ray, et cetera. Uh, I'd like to play one more piece for you because this one was one that sort of sent this project spiraling a bit out of control in a good way, um, but definitely a bit out of control. One of my favorite data sets I'd ever worked on for Chandra was this one on the screen here. This is the Perseus cluster of galaxies where at the very center is this very massive, super massive black hole. And there's all this hot gas surrounding it. And that black hole is essentially just burping out into that hot gas, causing pressure waves, which are sound waves. And the original researchers on this data had done the math to be able to discover that the sound being created is a B-flat, about 57 octaves below middle C. Um, and this isn't the only supermassive black hole that sings, by the way. There are other supermassive black holes out there in the universe that sing these songs that humans can't ever hope to hear. So in this case, the sonification was a re-sonification because there was an actual note being emitted. Just we are too far and we have hear, hearing that that's not quite sensitive enough to those low, low, low notes, right? These are hundreds and hundreds of piano keys too low for us to ever hear. And so we took this data and brought it back up into the range of human hearing. So B flat, 
but 57 octaves up higher than it should be. Um, and I'm working with some incredible partners on this project through System Sounds. Uh, Dr. Matt Russo and Andrew Santaquita are incredible sound engineers and musicians as well. And they've really helped guide the sound, um, you know, the sound feeling, I guess, or the sound bed, if you will, um, of this project. So here's what this supermassive black hole sound sounds like. Okay, that one's fun. Well, this one just exploded all over the place. Um, I had thought that this project was well listened to, well trafficked before. And then on a slow news Sunday in August, a NASA exoplanet account tweeted about the story that had come out a couple months prior. And it just organically grew and grew and grew until eventually it was all over the news. Um, I'll play a quick this, piece. Everyone, the actual sound of a black hole. Not the literal sounds from the cosmos, but a translation to help blind and low vision people appreciate the majesty of space. Chandra astronomers use NASA's flagship X-ray telescope to sonify these sound waves. What we're listening to is essentially a re-sonification, so a data sonification of an actual sound wave. That really reaches inside, doesn't it? So it was an incredibly exciting thing, but also honestly a bit overwhelming. We had about 2 billion impressions at the height of this viral moment, if you will, um, and really helped showcase, I think, the power of trying to deliver your data differently, right? Uh, to borrow a, a colleague's phrase, like to be able to take this information and not just prioritize a visual, but to think outside the box of other ways that you can take this data and make it accessible, make it explorable, make it knowable in some way. And so there's been a lot of activity ever since then. Somebody created an album out of these sonifications and you can listen to it as an LP, which I was never a record person until this. And now I absolutely am converted and understand how good the quality of sound is on a turntable. There's been a lot of interest in it from TV and movies and other arts and entertainment industry type of people. But we also did a research survey on it and we had about 4,500 responses analyzed in general over the sonification project. And primarily we're, we're seeing learning gains overall for both sighted and blind and low vision groups, very high enjoyment and engagement levels across the spectrum for both groups. Um, a lot of emotional responses recorded in the open-ended comments. So things like calm, peaceful, happy, or sometimes even, you know, scared, scary, frightening, depending on the person. Uh, lots of emotional responses were, were categorized in those open-ended comments. And that learning about access for how others can process information of our universe, that was significant for the sighted group. And for the blind and low vision group wanting to learn more in general about this type of work and about space in more broadly, um, we're also statistically significant. So i um, hoping to finish the paper on this real soon, like maybe next month if I can get my act together. Um, but this type of research study has been very helpful for us in addition to having the sort of evidence, if you will, from the popular user response, having a quantified research survey has also been helpful. Um, because I can say not all of the folks uh, really understood what this project would be about and would understand the worth of a project like this when we first started it. Uh, it was kind of seen like, a, you know, are they just kind of playing around what's going on with this. So being able to sort of showcase the value uh, in a more, you know, bite-sized way has been very helpful. But even with those two projects of 3D printing and sonification, I still felt like there was something missing. And so the last project or last piece of the sort of puzzle uh, that I wanna talk about today is this idea of visual descriptions, particularly rich visual descriptions. 
we've been working with our metadata for a long time. We definitely understood the value of having really good, you know, information about any product that you're putting out there, whether it's an image, whether it's a model, whether it's a sound, whatever. But for visual descriptions, it was a new project that we launched in 2021. Again, with partners from the blind and low vision community, this was important because it was all about providing uh, a real time detailed description of what is in the captured data, whether that was turned into an image, a time lapse, a sonification, an illustration, whatever, um, in a very specific way through a text format, through a sound based format, um, as sort of scaled down into alt text and metadata formats, and then even through a recorded like podcast feed. So I'll just give you an example of the type of work that we've been doing on the right is uh, an image or screen capture grab of the cat's eye nebula sonification. So I'll just read this first paragraph, but it says the cat's eye features a static image of an ethereal shape surrounded by concentric circles. The shape is the cat's eye nebula, a huge cloud of gas and dust blown off of a dying star. The concentric circles are bubbles expelled by the star over time. The dust cloud resembles a translucent pastry pulled to golden yellow points near our upper right and lower left with a blob of bright purple jelly inside the bulbous pale blue core. And it goes on from there, but that's sort of the main meats of that visual description. So there's a technique that we've been following in order to do these visual descriptions. One is it's describing just the image as it looks without any of the sort of scientific underpinnings was really not helpful and was actually unsatisfying for our users who are blind or low vision. Instead, what we really needed to do was braid those together into a cohesive whole that made sense and that didn't kind of take one part out and present only the other. And so in this case, being able to combine what the actual visual is, right? Like that translucent pastry, yes, it's important to describe what it's looking like, but also incorporates the science, right? So what is that bulbous jelly-like core, right? That's the high energy material from Enchanter that's heating up all of those bits and pieces. And so we've done a lot of testing. Each of these visual descriptions that we release of every single object that's coming out of Chandra in real time is very well tested and vetted um, with people who are blind, particularly one colleague, Christine Malik, who is now uh, consulting with us. Also, style issues became pretty important pretty quickly, right? So um, basic basic good science communication things, like really making sure you don't have any jargon, making sure that your writing style is at an appropriate level, making sure you're using frequent commas. Uh, commas are particularly important because especially for screen readers, they add a natural sort of pause. Keeping your sentences short, I have a tendency to write long sentences myself. So that was just like a really good reminder to keep your sentences short. Again, it lets you parse the information a little bit more naturally particularly if you have a screen reader. And then minimizing the use of the word it, uh, it should be something again that seems obvious, but this was just an excellent reminder for these kind of best practices. So, you know, referring to the object name a few times instead of reducing it down to it as you get tired writing your caption, right? So sticking with the cat's eye nebula, each time you need to wholly refer to that object. So all of these different kinds of style issues really helped tighten up um, both the, the strength of the visual descriptions and also the usefulness. And that had sort of long-term implications for us as well, right? This was thoroughly user tested. So now this style, it helps us inform how we write any Chandra caption. It's actually helped to improve our search engine optimization. So it's going beyond just accessibility inclusion, I'm putting air quotes because that's the important part of this, um, but it's benefiting other areas as well, right? So now our metadata tagging has been improved, uh, especially now that the IPTC has these more extensive accessibility tags that you can input through Adobe Bridge. That means you can strengthen your metadata without too much of a hassle. Uh, so the visual descriptions project has been another one that all night not quite as popular as the social, um, the, the sonification project has been the sort of thing where we've had a lot of anecdotal feedback from users saying, you know, I'm neurodivergent and I'm appreciating how you're describing the image in this detailed way, 
I'm a parent trying to describe something to my space enthusiast child and I don't know a ton about science and having this caption kind of lets me feel like I've got one of you sitting next to me kind of guiding me through the image as to what the important parts to see are. Um, we have other underlying data that had been taken from previous research projects that showed people really do like to have a sort of an expert sitting next to them, metaphorically speaking, right? Pointing out the important things to note in an image or in a sound or in a movie. Uh, what is it they should be understanding or seeing or feeling? And so that project, again, has been pretty wonderful to work with. We've done some group feedback through one of the NASA groups, um, uh, the NASA 508 group. They thought that the visual description was better than the sonifications because it was more of a one to one, even though you can get creative in your visual descriptions and therefore your alt text. Um, having this more of like a, a real one to one matchup of image and description every time it's released was great. Um, this idea of compressing really complex NASA data of very esoteric and abstract things, right? It helps you remove some of the noise. It reduces some of the mental load. Uh, bringing aesthetics back to description like the pre-TV radio announcers used to do. Uh, and the other feedback that they had given that, you know, they hoped others would implement this technique. So this project, I think, was also really exciting for us because it really just helped showcase that, you know, when we're working with all of this data of the universe, there are a lot of different ways that you can output it to the benefit of your users. And just like that classic cut curb effect, right? When they first started cutting a sidewalk and cutting that curb so that a wheelchair user could access it better, well, that meant that parents with strollers could also access it better. Somebody temporarily on crutches could access it better. A cyclist cutting illegally across the sidewalk could access it better, right? There are a number of important use cases for things like a cut curb. And similarly, with all of these projects that we've created, we just keep getting rewarded for them each time, right? The 3D um, printing project, we've started expanding by having tactile plates of two-dimensional images, which are very easy to print, uh, really easy to produce We're using an API developed by an astronomer who was blind in the UK. Um, so our 3D printing project continues to be something that we provide, again, for users who are blind or low vision, but that just keeps helping other users as well. Uh, the sonification project has taken on a life of its own and the visual description project is something that I'm just super passionate about. So I think there's this this idea, right, that when we're capturing data of the universe, things that is are so very unknowable to all of us, right? Supermassive black holes are not a very knowable thing. This idea that just putting the data in an archive or putting the data out as an image is making it accessible is, is really not the case. It's the idea of building up all the inclusive access points to that data. How can we think of our data differently? How can we create new things with it? And each time we do that, we also seem to be opening up new windows on the research side as well. Using sound to, to understand your science is a valid way of studying. Uh, using three-dimensional models or virtual reality as a way of, of scientific study, that's something being done now much more frequently. And so I think there is this lovely sort of you know, synergy here that making your data accessible can help all different angles of, of the story. So I will stop there because I definitely want to get to questions. Just a quick thank you to the funders and also to my colleagues. This, everything I've talked about today is not a me story. This is absolutely a we story. There are hundreds of people really that help out with all of these different angles, whether it's capturing the data, whether it's analyzing the scientific information or whether it's producing things um, towards the bottom of the pipeline, but just a quick nod at some of my colleagues who work very hard uh, to be a part of the scientific story.